Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we begin a brand new book of the Bible. We are in the New Testament book of Matthew. I'd like to volley back and forth between the Old Testament and the New Testament, kind of get some variety. We did do, we did Genesis, we did Exodus, and uh, so there are more books in the Old Testament, obviously. So I wanted to get those two in, and they flow, flow together very well anyway. Didn't want to disrupt that natural flow. But time for something different. The first book in the New Testament today is where we begin, the Gospel of Matthew. Looking forward to this. Always love looking at the story of Jesus and, and looking. I know the Word of God is all the Word of God. I, I get that. But there's something to me special about the Gospels and just seeing Jesus and um, listening to him speak through the Word. And again, of course, all of the Word of God is the Word of God. But I think you know what I mean. Anyway, you can open your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew, and while you're doing that, I will remind you once again that the Scripture verse-by-verse -verse website can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can study the whole Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, whichever book you want to study, at your own convenience, at your own pace, at thebibleversebyverse.com. You want to do it different than me right now? You can start in Genesis, go all the way through the Old Testament, then all the way through the New Testament if you want to, using my audio Bible commentaries. Very simple. Check it out. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And I'd love to hear from you. I hope you write me. Hope you hope you email me. Well, let's begin with prayer. Father, we ask your blessings on the Gospel of Matthew and on the word that we are going to look at today. Be our teacher. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The four Gospels were written primarily to four different groups of people. They were aimed at four groups of people. Now, all four Gospels are for us today. But it's important to recognize, for example, that the Gospel of Matthew was written primarily, primarily to the Jews. And since it was important for the Jews to understand that Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming Messiah, Matthew quotes a lot of Old Testament scriptures that point to the coming of the Messiah, that prove that Jesus fulfilled those scriptures. So Matthew emphasizes the fulfillment of Old Testament messianic prophecies. And it was important also for the Jews to understand that Jesus was the offspring of Abraham. And that's because all the promises of God would come through Abraham and his offspring, the Messiah, according to the book of Genesis. Again, God spoke to Abraham, said, through you, through your seed, shall all families of the earth be blessed. And the Jews knew what that was talking about. That was talking about the Messiah coming through the line of Abraham. Consequently, verse 1 makes it clear that the genealogy of Jesus Christ can be traced directly back to Abraham through David, their king, which was also important because the Jews understood that the Messiah would be in the kingly line of David. So, with that beginning, let's look at verse 2. The genealogy of Jesus Christ. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judas, Judas, and his brethren. So we see the genealogy of Jesus begin here in verse 2 
with Abraham, and we see the line of Abraham that will lead to the Messiah in the entirety of this genealogy. Verse 3, And Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar, and Perez begat Estram, and Estram begat Aram, and Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Naasan, and Naasan begat Salman, and Salman begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And if you read the book of Ruth, you'll see how this all came to place with Boaz and Ruth, who was a Moabitess. She wasn't even an Israelite, but she came and became an Israelite, and she followed the Lord God of Israel. And then it says that they begot Jesse. This is interesting. If you've ever studied the book of Ruth, I don't know if you've ever picked up on that, but Boaz and Ruth had a boy that they named Jesse, and lo and behold, he was the father of King David. Look at verse 6. And Jesse begot David, the king. And David, the king, begot Solomon, of her that had been the wife of Urias. <laughs> you talk about the grace of God. Here you got David, who was king of Israel, committed adultery with one of his best friend's wife, had his best friend killed to cover it up. And of course, it was a terrible sin, and there were temporal um, consequences and punishments for that sin. But God forgave and gave him a fresh start, and David and that woman who he then married, Bathsheba, had a son named Solomon. And Solomon was God's hand-chosen successor to the throne of Israel after David, lied. So, after David died. So there is life after sin. David is proof of that. You know, when you commit sin, Many, many times there are temporal consequences and sometimes temporal punishments for that sin. It has fact, it has effects, negative effects. But in the midst of that, if you repent of your sin and you confess it, you can start over with God. There might be some lingering effects of your sins and your previous sins, but you can start fresh with God and God can bless you from this point on and even use that bad. To bring about good, spiritual good for you. And so that was the case. In verse 7, And Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Jehoshaphat, Josephat, and Josephat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekiel. And Ezekiel begat Manasses, and Manasses begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josiah. Boy, I'll tell you, there's some real characters in this genealogy. Wow. Mean guys, wicked, cruel, horrible people. Manasses, he was terrible. He was in the kingly line of David, and he was an ancestor of the Messiah. Miserable, wicked man. Burned his own kids and offering them to Molech, the false god. Just a horrible, horrible person. He did repent. He repented. And he was forgiven. I don't have any doubt about that, but he sure caused a lot of trouble. Anyway, where do we leave off? Verse 11. And Josias begot Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away into Babylon. And after that, they were brought to Babylon. Jeconias begat Salatiel, and Salatiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliud, and Eliud begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. I read 
it might have been tedious to you, but I wanted to read the genealogy of Jesus because I wanted to emphasize the abrupt change in language when it came to Joseph. Did you notice that all the men in the genealogy up until this point begat their son, and it says the same thing over again, and then their son begat this one, and their son begat that one. It was the same old thing over and over again, several times. But then you get to Joseph, and it says Joseph begot or uh, Jacob begot Joseph. It doesn't say, and Joseph begot Jesus. It says, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. See? Jesus is not the son of Joseph. As we will see, he's the son of God. Mary's his mother. God is his father. Joseph is his stepfather. Now, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to Jacob were 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away of, into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, that means they were well, we would say engaged, except it was a lot more serious than today's engagement period. Um, back in those days, you were engaged, but if you were engaged, you were considered to be married. So it was a time of testing to make sure that you were pure, that the, the, the woman was pure, she was a virgin. But um, so... You were considered marriage. And the only way to break an engagement back in those days was to have a divorce. I didn't come together and live in the same place until that espousal period was over. So that's kind of the, well, that is the, the time period where you have Joseph and Mary. But notice what it says. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, they were in this period of espousal. Before they came together, so they had not had sexual relations, she was found with child. And that's the only thing that mattered to Joseph at this point. She was found with child. That's the only thing that mattered to her parents. That's the only thing that mattered to anybody who knew about it. Is that she was found with child. And then it goes on to say, of the Holy Ghost. Joseph was not the father of Jesus, as I said. It says that Mary was expecting before Joseph and her came together. Again, Joseph was not the father of Jesus. God was the father of Jesus. Jesus is called the second Adam in the Bible. He's called the second Adam. And he was like Adam in that his human nature, the human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, was a direct creation of God the Father. Unlike the rest of us, who are all begotten of our fathers and our mothers, Jesus was not. So he's virgin born. He isn't born with original sin like the rest of us. His soul is clean as a whistle. He does not have a sin nature. We inherit our sin nature from our fathers, all the way back to Adam. Jesus did not have a sin nature. He was a son of God, directly the son of God, which he had been in eternity past, forever and ever. The son of God had always existed. He just became flesh when he was conceived in the womb of his mother Mary. Verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Joseph was a just man, so he, he couldn't just overlook what she obviously, to him, had done. She, Joseph couldn't marry her. 
I mean, because in his eyes, I mean, let's face it. How would you feel? She committed adultery. She committed fornication. He can't marry her because he's a just man. And yet he loved her. He could have had her stoned to death. But he kept it secret. He was just going to divorce her quietly, just between me and you, Mary. We're just going to, you know, we're just going to do this just between me and you. That's, that's what his plan was. He loved her. In spite of what she did, he must have just been heartbroken, shocked and heartbroken. Don't you think? I mean, obviously, Mary was a pure woman. She was it's not sinless, no, because no one is sinless except Jesus. But she must have been a good, godly woman, or, or the Father never would have chosen Mary to be the mother of his son. So Joseph has to be thinking anyone but Mary. This can't be. It's like he was hit over the side of the head with a two-by-four. He's got to be in shock. Disbelief. Oh, there it is. Right in front of him. One thing Joseph was not was angry, though. Or bitter. Which is a real credit to Joseph. Verse 20. Because you know this has to sting. But while he thought on these things... He was thinking about how he's going to divorce her quietly, privately, not make a big deal out of it. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost." I, this is the only thing that could have convinced Joseph that Mary had not been unfaithful. God steps in in the nick of time and informs Joseph that Mary had not been unfaithful. In fact, the child that she was carrying was actually the son of God. Joseph thought that Mary was bad. She was not bad. In fact, she must have been pretty good. And like I said, not sinless, but she must have been pretty good, pretty godly, or the Lord never would have chosen her to be the mother of his son. Or, yeah, of his son. It just never would have happened. So God the Holy Spirit, and I don't know, I don't know all the details how this worked out. Don't ask me. God the Holy Spirit created the embryo in Mary's womb. She's expecting but she's still a virgin. Joseph misunderstood what was happening. But you got to believe that when he heard the truth from the angel who appeared to him in the dream, he sure must have felt a lot better. In fact, I would say his feelings probably were completely and totally reversed. In an instant, this situation went from a gut-wrenching, horribly, unbelievably terrible thing to an unimaginably great thing for Joseph. In an instant, it was a complete switch. Which is a reminder to us that it doesn't take long for God to change things when the time for change comes. It's important for us to remember that God can step in and change things from bad to good in an instant by either giving us more understanding of a situation like he did with Joseph or by changing the circumstances themselves. Either way, God can change things really quickly. So keep that in mind, lest you become discouraged in those things that you are praying for. Verse 21. And he shall bring forth a son, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus 
is the same as the Hebrew word named Joshua. And uh, the name means the Lord saves. So Jesus means the Lord saves. Jesus is the Lord God of Holy Scripture. He is the creator of heaven and earth, according to the book of Colossians. He came to earth to save man from hell. He came to die on the cross, and he came to pay for our sins. But notice what it says here. It says that Jesus saves his people from their sins. Not all people. His people. Which means you have to repent. And you have to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because when you do that, then you become a child of God. Then you become one of his people. And then he saves you from hell. Because he's come to save his people from their sins. 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. It was written that this would happen. Actually, this verse is quoting Isaiah which was given to Isaiah, which was written down in the Old Testament 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah the prophet wrote that a virgin would give birth and that the child would be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And so we see that Jesus, the virgin born son of Mary, whose father was God, was actually God with us. God manifest in the flesh. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. Which means that everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did showcased God to absolute perfection. Everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did showed the love of God, the power of God, the holiness of God, the person of God. Jesus reveals God to us because at his birth he became God manifest in the flesh, actually when he was conceived. Verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. He didn't waste any time. As soon as he got up, he realized what happened. He knew this was God speaking to him. And he immediately marries Mary. Joseph clearly had faith in God because he believed God's word and he obeyed God's word. Joseph believed the angel who delivered him the word of God. The angel was God's messenger and he obeyed the word of God as soon as he heard it. First chance he got. And of course, I don't know if he did this or not, but I can see where he might have. If Joseph had projected into the future, he might have thought, who in the world is going to believe our story about, about this child being the son of God? Who's going to believe Mary? Who's going to believe me? And if he had doubts, he was exactly right, because most, if not all, would believe that, that Joseph and Mary broke the laws against sexual immorality. But Joseph obeyed the Lord anyway. 
and he took Mary to be his wife in spite of what he probably thought the future would hold for them, being looked down upon. You know, he could have just divorced himself from the whole thing and disobeyed God. But he wasn't that type of a man. He'd obey God and take whatever lumps would go along with that. And sometimes the right things that we do look like wrong things. And while appearance is important, appearance is important for Christians, it's not as important as obeying God. Doing the right thing is more important than looking right. So some people are going to misunderstand. Can't help that. He's got to do what is right in the eyes of God. You cannot avoid doing the will of God simply because some people will misunderstand you. You cannot avoid obeying the word of God simply because some people will misunderstand your motives or won't agree with what you're doing. It doesn't matter. We must obey God rather than pleasing man. And then it says in verse 25, and knew her not, did not have sexual relations with her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. And the implication is that after Jesus was born of the virgin to fulfill the Old Testament scripture, then they had a normal husband-wife relationship, which would be in line with God's command for married people. There's no virtue in a husband and wife not having sexual relationships, unless, like the Bible says, it's for a short period of time. But then God quickly adds, and then get back together, lest Satan tempt you. Chapter 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. The wise men, better known to some as the Magi, came to Jerusalem when Herod was the king. Herod, Herod is called the king of the Jews, but Herod was not even a Jew. He was not a physical descendant of Abraham. In fact, he was from the country beneath Israel, Edom. He was an Edomite. He wasn't a Jew, but more important than anything, he wasn't saved. And here you have an unsaved man sitting on the throne of Israel. You say, how did he get there? Rome put him there. To keep peace. He wasn't saved. He did not serve God. And worse than that, he didn't care about God. So look at verses 1 and 2. That's going to become apparent real quick. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, how did these wise men make a connection between a star that they followed from, from several hundred miles away? How did they make the connection to this special star that they knew was special because they were into astronomy? How did they make that connection between a special star and Jesus, the birth of the Messiah? Well, there's only one way. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the Old Testament and a prophecy back in, uh, in the days of Balaam, the prophet, the false prophet, but that was given anyway at that particular time in the Old Testament. So these wise men, they may have had the entire Old Testament, or maybe they only knew the scripture that connected a special star to the birth of Messiah. But either way, they lived up to that truth that they had, and they showed real faith here by traveling hundreds of miles to find this messianic king based on the word of God that they had 
and to worship him. They believed the word of God and they acted on it. And I got to stop. We'll pick it up right here in verse 3. If you want to continue studying the word of God, this book or any other book of the Bible, go to thebibleversebyverse.com. Click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Open your Bible. Follow along and listen as I teach it verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study the whole Bible at your convenience at your own pace at the thebibleversebyverse.com. And please remember that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. If you want to be a part of this ministry, you can be through your prayers and your financial support, and you can give in a secure method at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Give as the Lord may lead. Simply click on the donate button at the top of the front page, and you'll be part of this ministry with your prayers and financial support. Stand by me, would you, and help me to get out the Word of God. I would appreciate it. Remember, I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. I never have been. This is a faith ministry. I depend on listeners like you who love the Word of God and are moved by God. I'll see you next time.